Omi Vadia is an Indian American actor, best known for his performance in Three Idiots. What a film. In addition, Vadia has also played roles on The Office, which we'll talk about, and Arrested Development. Uh, he's here today to discuss his career and talk to us about a new project he's working on on Dilip Singh Song, the first Sikh congressman, the first Indian American congressman, the first Asian congressman. Uh, so a lot of, uh, of awesome things to talk about. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks so much. It's, it's wonderful to hear about myself in third person. That's really nice. So the least I can do. <laughs> well, we want to we want to start at least, you know, where you grew up and uh, you have you had a pretty interesting upbringing. You grew up in Joshua Tree. You were super interested in, in film and acting, it seems straight away. So do you want to just kind of give people some perspective on your background? Yeah. So like most Indians, uh, South Asians, they typically come to America and they they try to find other South Asians um, for the most part. Some of them get scattered all over the place. Um, but we were one of those people or families that really did not find ourselves in any ethnic enclaves or we were really out in rural California, mainly around white people um, and lower socioeconomic status white people. My dad was a doctor and that's where he could get a job. Uh, it was very hard to get a job, a good one. So, so he took that and um, yeah, we grew, the, grew up there really having a Indian identity or a sort of South Asian, Hindu, whatever you want to call that uh, identity uh, within the house, but outside the house, uh, you know, it was just try to survive. And back then, you know, the only things on television were really um, the Simpsons, you know, I'd say was the only uh, cultural sort of person that was, uh, and it's sad, it's a c cartoon, it's not even a real person. Um, and that's sort of what we were identified as, or someone who works at 7-Eleven, uh, something like that. And, um, you know, rather than fight that, really just ignore that and try to assimilate, right? Try not to be very Indian, try to be like everybody else. I definitely remember growing up sort of wishing I wasn't different. And, um, and you know, that sort of continued. Uh, I had this sort of identity as a Marathi. I speak Mara Marathi, I'm Maharashtrian. So I grew up, um, you know, having this secret identity and then ex ex externally performing in a different way. And, you, you know, that I think has something to do with sort of my career as well. I sort of fooled around in many different types of activities and then ultimately found out that I was quite good at performing and uh, emoting and people reacted well. And I'd always been a jokester, not taking life seriously really. So I could do that on stage and people enjoyed that. So uh, from there, there was, uh, I, I, I started improving in, in, in high school and then there was a special art school in LA and uh, I auditioned to get into there and I lived with my brother and went to a special art school, kind of like fame, but for LA. And then from there went to college uh, and um, you know graduated from NYU film. But really the stories I didn't want to, I didn't really want to tell any stories about Indian people, sort of really not very close to my Indian um, sort of identity. It wasn't really until I went to India and I did that Bollywood movie. Uh, that's really what changed everything. Cause I was sort of thrown into, um, this Indian world and I sort of had to perform as if as if I enjoyed it as if I was Indian I even had the the whole head shake and an Indian accent oh yeah because when you talk like this to like the news people they're like god that guy's pretty like relaxed and <laughs> the American attitude is also kind of like so it's like more reverence you know yes I'm really very like being yeah you, you got it down for sure oh yeah so it's just so weird and people are like why are you talking like that and it's just sort of what you do. Even like white people that go there, they start to have that because it's very, it's just part of the communication style. So, um, so you know, once I went there, I, I started realizing, wow, I have this like other identity and I can really connect to these people who are from completely different backgrounds that, and I can, and I don't have a certain sort of, I'm not from this fancy rich lifestyle 
I can connect to anyone. And I really enjoyed that. And I really started to see, you know, I didn't really belong so much in America. There was a lot of people that were there. I didn't really belong in India. I was very, very somewhere in the middle. And that wasn't something to be um, ashamed of or feel you know, like less than. It was something to be proud of. I, I encompass something that is very rare, you know, in some ways um, that I can connect to people in India and I can connect to people here. Um, and that's really kind of special. So, so that sort of has been my journey so far and, and it's, it's been really enjoyable. I mean, who, who was like the generation of Indian American actors that you were running around with in Hollywood and LA back in the, I, back in the heyday? Back in the heyday, like this was after uh, Cal Penn, right? Okay. So he, he sort of made it already and we never really saw him. But I mean, um, Rizwan Manji, do you remember? You know, yeah, from, of course. Oh yeah, he was hustling just like all of us. And then there's all those guys from the outsource, outsourced uh, the show. I sort of I missed that, that show. show. I, I know you guys love that show. Uh, outsourced that show. Uh, I missed that show because I was in India, but that was all those guys that sort of came up from that are sort of who you're seeing now. Yeah. And then there's like a new sort of Indian like archetype, which is like really good looking Sendil Ramamurthy type of guys. <laughs> so uh, those, those, that's like a new thing. And that's nice. Hassan Minhaj is, he's coming for the top. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's, yeah. All those guys. So, you know, even, um, yeah, so those were really the people that I, I saw, you know, and they're, they're, they're working actors. They really haven't really made it to the huge levels um, of uh, Dave Patel and all these guys, but, but they continue to work and, you know, that's, that's admirable. So. What, what made you uh, transition into production and directing and, you know, making it this way instead of acting? Well, um, Acting came naturally to me. I, I've done it since I was six. I used to do like plays in Marathi in like the in the small community theater type of thing that we had, and um, I was good at it. But I was always limited to how I looked, and you know, a short, uh, kind of funny uh, guy. I would always get side characters, and as a as an as a like a senior in, in a in high school going to this like prestigious school you know you just had these huge ambitions and you were limited um so when i started doing short films i really saw how much more creative it was to be behind the camera and how much more you could manipulate the audience you could uh, use different tools in it and it didn't matter what you look like and uh, i really enjoyed that i mean i've always enjoyed acting um but there you, you sit around half the day waiting for your role to start and the high is for like 10 15 minutes and it's an amazing high maybe but that's it you know that's that then you go back to your trailer and you sit it's a lot of waiting so um there's a lot of like recognition and a lot of like fame that comes around it but i really wasn't caring for much of that i really cared for the challenge and as a director and as a person who writes uh, there, it's a lot more challenging. It's so, it's so much more challenging because you, you have so many more chess pieces. And when you're an actor, you're sort of like a pawn. You could be very, very effective, but you have to make the person that's moving you has, has to do a good job, you know? Makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, interestingly though, in the United States, you are most famously known uh, for being an actor, particularly in the office, at least with our audience as a sick. I remember when I watched the first, uh, that first scene where you made your appearance, I was just a young uh, teenager, I think. And it was, it was incredible. I mean, today it's a little bit controversial given um, the dynamics and we can talk about that, but Good. at the time um, it poked fun of a lot of the dynamics, frankly, that I had to face in my own life um, and how I knew people were perceiving me when I walked outside with a turban which was, I could tell that my presence made people fearful mm. in the in the height of 9-11. Yeah. And um, when I saw the um, skit, because I was a loyal office viewer, it spoke to my lived experience, which I think, you know, at that time was, it was rare. Uh, it, it's still rare, but even more so back then. 
do you want to talk about that experience? Do you want to talk about how you got on the show? Yeah. yeah. So after NYU, where I went to film school, I came back to California and started editing features. And I was, you know, not really getting that much work. Uh, I was struggling to to get out there. And I had this talent in my hip pocket and I really wasn't using it. And I was an act, I, I've been an actor for years. I just put it on the back burner. So I was like, you know what? Let me just do this as a side hustle. And, um, you know, I had a couple of friends who were junior agents at small agencies and they, they you know, took me on and, and I immediately started going out and booking roles. And um, it was not, it was because I sort of had done this. It was very comfortable for me. So I think one of the big roles that I first got was on Arrested Development. And um, it was a very small role, but I beat a lot of other people out. And um, yeah, it was a big show back then and there was no Indian on it. So there was no Indians anywhere. So anytime you got on a show as an Indian, it was, you were sort of, successful at breaking a ceiling of some sort and um yeah and that role was uh again a very over the top accented role uh i i only had one line i was running against uh the, the michael sarah in the uh the student uh whatever like president thing and and my line was something like um i had a video i was showing a video to get people to vote and it was like starvation, you know, all these things, all this, you know, poverty. That's what my life was like before I moved to Corona Del Mar, you know? So it was like, also kind of like playing on this idea that this is what we think of Indians and then flipping it. And uh, that casting director, she took a shining to me. So she started bringing me in for other stuff. And she brought me in, she, she you know, there was this office role. And by that time, The Office wasn't a big show. It was in its second season, just started. The first season was very similar to the British first season. And I was a huge fan of the British uh, show. I had watched it and I had loved how realistic it was. I had never seen any kind of television like that. Even the American Office is, is an over the top show. If you watch the British one, you really have to listen. Otherwise you'll like, these are just people talking quietly to each other in a documentary. Um, they really stuck to the documentary form. And um, I really enjoyed that show and how realistic it was. So I kind of knew the format very well. I knew how you look to the camera. I know how you don't overact. Uh, everything is understated. So um, I knew that uh, I could do this and at least give it a good shot. And then I remember being like, this guy has a turban. Shoot, I could just go in there and do it but like it would be really effective if i had a turban now i've never done hat and worn a turban in my life and i don't know how to wear one but i did have this white scarf that uh was quite long it was um it, it was something a, a woman really should wear it's, it's kind of shiny and and you know sort of hairs coming out and it wasn't the right material but um in the car right before i went in i remember putting that on and being like, hey, that's not bad. <laughs> you know? And and I went in there and I remember walking in and an Indian guy was walking in and he was like, oh shit, you know, like this guy's going in with, with the turban. Like it's not a perfect turban, but he's like going all out. And, um, you know, it was a choice. It was a risky choice because a lot of times you're not really supposed to dress like the character completely. But I, I knew to be effective, I needed to, you know, this is this is sort of an from the perspective of a um, white Caucasian American. This is a weird looking person in their eyes. However, he's acting normally, completely normally, so normally that it's hilarious. So that is really the visual um, look is very sort of important in the comedy from their perspective. So. I, uh, so I really went for it and they, they didn't, you know, you don't know you're, you're auditioning for the casting director. So it's a video and you, you just shoot it and then you leave and you go, okay, that was great. And you know, typically you get a call in like a week or so and I didn't get the call. So I was like, okay, I'm going to shave this beard off, which I had slowly been growing. Not nothing like your beard, but enough to like, it was something. And, um, then, oh, two weeks later I get a call and they're like, 
yeah, we want you to come back in. And I was like, where's that scarf? And we want to cut you to come to the, they did the, the callback on set, which is kind of rare. Um, so it was in front of the director who happened to be, I believe uh, that was Greg Daniels or um, Paul Fake, who are huge names now, you know? Both of them were huge back then, but they're even bigger now. So that's the creator of Simpsons and then the creator of Bridesmaids, you know, like huge guys. And I didn't know any of this because I, that, and that was a good thing. And um, I would just uh, perform and I had a little bit of stubble, you know, at that point. And, you know, and they were like, I was like, okay, cool. And you could see they were very happy with it. And I was like, cool, when's it going to shoot? And they were saying, oh, in two days. And I was like, okay, cool. This, uh, I don't have enough beard. I hope they have a beard for me. They can, you can get that glue and make a beard. Like I've, I've done a role like that and it takes an hour or two. So anyway, I come to set, I believe they had brought, uh, thank God, a turban, uh, like a person, his name is Opinder. He's like the turban dresser for all of Hollywood. Like he does it. And- uh, That is some interesting stories. <laughs> and he, uh, he did the turban, he tied it and they pinned it because they wanted to use it possibly for other uh, episodes or whatever, which they brought it out like three years later and put it back on my head. So I think it was a little looser and I don't think it looks as well in the second episode, but they clearly didn't want to pay him again. So, um, so that was one thing. And then I was like, uh, you know, props, like where's the gutta and stuff. And like, they didn't have anything. And I luckily someone had given me a kata and I kind of kept it, um, I keep it in my car, like as a good luck or something. And it's like right on my, it wasn't a shifter, but like my windshield wiper stick. And I pulled that out and I uh, used it. So luckily that's why he had a kata on. Otherwise <laughs> he wouldn't have you had messed it. it up, man. Nice. I know. And then like, I was, the name was Sadiq. And I was sort of like, that's not a, you know, it's, I mean, like any, anything, harp, any reek would have <laughs> yeah. been good, any sort of any in there. <laughs> in there, anything, but you never saw his name. He was never actually referred to. So I also did not make a big deal. And I'm like, not going to make a big deal. Like I, I really visibly, physically cannot at, at this point, because I'm just, hey, really, you're like, I need the work. <laughs> I'm the least important person on set at this point. Yeah. It's like, you're lucky to be here. So but I was a little surprised that like, you know, Mindy Colling was on that show and she's a writer. So I would have thought that there would have been a little bit more. Um, Cultural you know. awareness. I thought, I mean, I thought again, at that time there was not, there was nothing. So I thought it was fine for the time. Obviously today it would, it wouldn't work. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to know why you think, uh, why is it controversial today and why wouldn't it work today? You know, I, I think it, it just wouldn't, you know, I, again, I don't. I didn't find it controversial, but I think today folks feel as if uh, that it was a parody of sex. I didn't feel it that way. I felt that for the time it was a genuine representation or a, a, an attempt at a genuine representation of sex as normal people, as we always wanted to be perceived, and the people that it was kind of poking fun of, which was. Um, was people that were overreacting to people that look different, but are otherwise like everybody else. And we actually, Sean and I actually ran with that and made our own skit with Funny or Die. And it was based completely based off your scene. Yeah. Uh, and another office scene, actually. And uh, we did it the opposite, where someone is so trying to be so uh, inclusive that they're, they're being just as ignorant. Mm -hmm. As uh, and see, la seeing the person's humanity and seeing mm -hmm. them as like a avatar, right. than uh, uh, than anything else. And that video was phenomenally successful uh -huh. uh, it, with 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 audiences it, within the industry. So there's something in that skit that I think speaks to the kind of universal nature of seeing uh, people as as human beings, no matter where they come from. Um, there's another um, big uh, thing that you're working on with regards to the sick community which is um, your uh, biopic on Dalip Singh Sand. Uh, yeah. Do you want to speak to that? 
Absolutely. Um, yeah, um, there is this, uh, th I, I do a lot of like nonprofit work and galas where I fundraise and I speak. And one at one, at one, um, I met this man named Dr. Marwa, who, who is this also been on this podcast. Oh, really? That's yeah. awesome. I'm Rajit Singh Marwa. What a, what a man he is. Yeah. So he was a pretty awesome man. And he, he was getting sort of this lifetime achievement award. And I was like, that's awesome. This guy seems great. But he was actually talking sort of great about this other guy who's named Dilip Singh San. And he was the first um, congressman, uh, Indian, Sikh, uh, South Asian, Asian congressman to ever make it like get elected in America. And that was in the 50s. And I was like, what? What? Is that true? Like, I've never heard of this person. And then I looked around at all the other Indian people and no one had heard about this person. And I started to research this guy's life. And he's just one of those hidden figures as um, that, you know, should be uh, sort of celebrated because he broke open a lot of doors and should make things easier for us. But like, you know, growing up as I did in Joshua Tree, I used to think like, oh, I'm one of the first to experience this sort of racism, this ignorance. And I had no idea that like 30, 40 years before, this guy was dealing with much worse things and what his aim and his, uh, you know, resolve to be something more was so much greater. If I had sort of known that back then, I think I would have felt a little bit better and I probably wouldn't have uh, disassociated myself as much from my my South Asian sort of identity. But uh, Dilip Singh San, he came here in the 20s. He, he went to school at Berkeley. He tried to become a, a, a math uh, professor, but he couldn't, nobody would hire him. So he decided to go into farming and he became a farmer. Um, then he, he fell in love with a, uh, an American, or a, a basically American immigrant, or actually, yeah, she was an American immigrant. And back then, if an American citizen marries, you know, South Asians weren't allowed to become citizens at that point. It was an Asian Exclusion Act, which as it sounds racist, because it is, um, if you try to marry an, a person that, that isn't an American citizen, especially an Asian person, you lose your citizenship, which is just really regressive. And uh, so this, not only did he woo this woman, he convinced her to marry him and he lost, you know, she lost her, her, her um, citizenship. And then he worked towards removing this exclusion act and finally became a citizen um, somewhere around, you know, the late forties. And then he decided he wanted to be a judge. And in the area, he ran for judge. It was a difficult run, but he, he did really well. He helped a lot of domestic violence um, cases in that area. Um, and he was sort of a, a socialite, sort of an odd socialite in this white world of, of rural Pasadena, if you could say. And then ultimately uh, the congressman in that area decided to retire and he said, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run for office and people just laughed at him and uh, he won the primary. And then he was up against an Amelia Earhart type of famous aviator who, whose husband was, uh, really good friends with Eisenhower. So, you know, he's doing little small barbecues and this woman is uh, doing a fair with uh, Bing Crosby as the guest, you know, like he's completely out of competition, but he keeps sticking to his guns. He's not going negative. He's talking about the issues of these farmers and he ultimately wins by 3% becoming the first um, Asian to ever get into Congress. And, uh, you know, he was on a track to be a Senator. Uh, unfortunately he got a stroke and it's, it stopped him from doing that. But um, yeah, I mean, if his, his life would have gone a little differently, I think we all would have known his name and, you know, maybe some, we would have had a Kamala Harris a little earlier, you know, but, but he still matters and his story still happened. And, and I think, there are people that maybe haven't even been born yet that can that can uh, benefit from knowing this. So the first thing we're doing is making a children's book actually. 
we're going to make a children's book and we're working on a short film so that people can see this guy's life and see how exciting it is and how cinematic it is and if that is valuable and if if those are are popular then we will branch out into a, a feature film because um you know i think the story really needs to be told uh and everybody that i tell it to is so excited and they're either a fan or they want to actively support it so so yeah it's just a matter of time and it's not about me really this is this project isn't about showing me off it's actually about making sure that this story gets out there so so yeah it's it's been a really collaborative process and um a lot of community feedback and uh and that's what it's about you know how are you envisioning this film in relation to what Asian representation in film has kind of be, like transcended recently? Well, it's definitely trending. And, you know, it's, it, I tried to make, I tried to get people excited about this in the industry like five or six years ago. And they were like, yeah, okay. But now it's like a whole movement of like these sort of hidden stories of American, you know, immigrants and, and sort of alternate stories. So that's been really great. Um, but I mean, um, this is really more of a biopic. So I think we're going to start at the start and, you know, as him as a child and move towards him uh, sort of coming here and understanding sort of the struggles that he dealt with and then the, the, the sort of ideas that he had and wishes he had. And, and then ultimately it'll probably end with him winning the, uh, the, the seat, the congressional seat. What he did after that is, you know, is really great, but it gets into law and it gets into, you know, basically the stuff, Congress stuff, which is not that appealing as cinematically. What's really cinematically appealing is the struggle to, to win and, and to, to beat the other side, which is much more larger. So it's sort of a David and Goliath story and, um, you know, the, the uh, American dream story and uh this is all before civil rights even so it's 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 kind of remarkable that he was able to do this he almost he snuck his way in and uh and i unfortunately i, I believe probably because he snuck his way in no one he really made a big fuss out of it you know yeah absolutely no that makes a lot of sense and i think his message of inclusivity which is something that we had heard from dr marwa but also had, had read about and understood in his life and biographies he was all about bringing people in and it's inspiration for the national sick campaign and what we're hoping to do with we are six and what you're doing i think generally this type of work where we bring these stories of inclusivity to light and highlight them and make them something proud like something for us to be proud about and to advertise and promote is really important so i just wanted to kind of get your thoughts on how important is entertainment slash positive exposure about the South Asian community, about Sikhism, about most things that need more positive light? And how do you expect more projects to get kind of mainstream exposure generally? Oh, gosh, it's I think it's really important because a lot of people are not tuned into these types of issues. And they're just living their life nine to five. And they want some sort of escape or some entertainment and within that entertainment they can number one get entertained but also learn about something that you know is different or have a different point of view there is that opportunity for them to just pause for a second just like you did in the office what is that about oh michael scott is being stupid right that's all it really is from from a very very you know quick reference but if you look closer you're like maybe you don't even see it you're subconsciously like oh, that that's just a normal guy <laughs> and look at michael scott is being stupid but you just said that is a normal guy so like that is sort of what uh you have the ability to do with entertainment media any any, any sort of messaging here and you know the point of it is not to be a psa i, I think a lot of film films that are sort of like done by South Asians sometimes can be preachy and dogmatic. And what they're really doing is just playing to the choir. And, uh, you know, they'll get a lot of support from the South Asian community, but they won't really ever cross over. Really, this film has to play with 
that guy in Kansas, you know, that guy, I'm, I'm making generalizations here, but like the Midwest belt, if they can watch this movie and feel the emotion and feel the feeling of wanting to root for this person that doesn't look like them, that uh, doesn't uh, talk like them, but, but they still want him to succeed over the person that does look at them, then I think that we've made a breakthrough there and it will have an effect subtly but long term over that person's psyche that they will just take pause and you know you know it's very hard these are not quantitative things that we're doing where you know if i show this much you know characters on tv this person will not uh, attack and uh be uh you know offensive to this sort of other people it's it's not that way but the more that we see these things the more that they're out there, the more choices we have to watch them, I believe that people will, you know? I mean, I, I, I just hope that they will. And uh, I hope that they share and they, they see that. But, but when you ask that question, how do we wanna show this story? We really wanna show it in a way that, that uh, Americans and the world will, will be appealed to it. You know, I think that's really important. Uh, some people would call that a compromise, but I really don't think that's a compromise. I think that's, um, I think it's, it's, it, it's just an important way of how you format it so that it gets the largest audience and um, it can make the most impact. I, I really think that is what's really important. So the sensibilities aren't going to be a Bollywood film. I mean, they're making a Bollywood film on that uh, marathon runner who's Sikh. Oh, just saying. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're making a uh, one on that. So like, I, I'm not having holding too much hope in that film, but, uh, but uh, I know that uh, I wanna make a film that non-Indians will also watch and just be like, wow, do you know that story about, you know, that Sikh guy that, that won the uh, Congress? I want people to, to know that, you know, now we're sort of celebrating Kamala Harris and that is a fantastic thing, by the way, but we have to know how that happened. Why did Absolutely. that happen? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the Leap Singh Sons was the, the start of that. Um, so a very timely uh, mission. Uh, last question for you, Sean, I don't know if you have, if you have another one, but um, you know, you, you've done well in, uh, by any measure in the acting and, and directing world, particularly as a South Asian. What is your advice to young people that are looking to get into this space uh, that want to make a living uh, doing what you do? Oh, man. I've just been very lucky, I'll tell you. You think it's like, you think it's like a bunch more than that. I mean, you got to think about it. Like I started acting at six. So like most of the Indian kids were not allowed to do what I was doing, right? Like I had a head start. I went to a special art school. Like it, it, it is not just, you know, pure talent or whatever you want to call that. It, there was many things in my, my parents were supportive, extremely supportive when I finished college and was just living in somebody's garage that was made into a, into a room. They were very supportive. There wasn't like, well, you're not bringing in money. You're shaming the family. You could have been a doctor. What are those things? I mean, all of those things, if I had had those, I would have never been able to get this far. So people have to understand, even before I made my first success, which there were hundreds of rejections before then, I had so much support from my family. And, um, and it, we were isolated, as I said, we didn't grow up around other Indians. So, you know, that whole lokyakete didn't exist for us. So, I was able to have free reign. It was only when I was like 27, I was like, what am I doing with my life? Barely making any money here. So it was like my own sort of like self uh, conscious, but I think you really need to have a lot of support, whether that's from your family and some people don't have that. You need to develop that from friends and supporters so that you can do this thing that is extremely hard. It's, you know, it's so, there's a reason that Indian people become doctors and engineers. You go to school, you get your master's, you go this, you get your good job, you get married, you get the Tesla, you're done, right? That's it. It's easy. I mean, it may be hard, the work is hard, but the path is clear. 
Here, the path is not clear. So you have to be okay with the path not being clear. That's very important. You will not probably not get what you want when you want it. You may never get it, but what you will get will be an extremely interesting experience. And what are you there for? Are you there for the art? Are you there for the acting? Or are you there to make sure that you become successful? There's so many easier ways to be successful. But if you're there to, to perform, if that's why you love this, you know, uh, if you would perform for pennies in, in the park because you enjoyed it, if that was enough for you to sustain you, then I would say then you can be an actor, you can perform. But if, if you need these other things, you know, like it's very hard to see all of your friends getting buying houses and, you know, going on, on fancy uh, vacations at four, four seasons and stuff while you continue to struggle and you may get a role and then you, you know, there's, it's not like a promotion. It's just a tiny role and it could lead to more, but it could just be the same thing over again. So, so it has to be internal satisfaction, internal contentment that you have and fine, not external. I think that goes for anyone in any career, but specifically in this one, because it will burn you out. And luckily I have a family, I've been able to get married, I have children. So I have so many other important priorities that are so valuable to me that, and I was lucky so I can continue doing this art. But if some time comes where I can't do this art, I'm, I'm not ability to afford wise, I will happily and gladly do the nine to five so that I can support my family and be with these wonderful people who I care about. So I, I don't know what advice I can give these people, but I'd say that you really got to train. There is no like, uh, I just, I'm self-taught kind of thing. This doesn't work. Uh, you have to be, you know, take as much feedback as you can. Understand what you're good at and what you want to do may not be the same thing because I am very good at acting and I have other passions, but I continue to be pushed or, or sort of pulled into acting. And, I, and it's good, it's good, it's, it's wonderful, people love it. They, so um, I continue to do it, but it's not exactly what I wanted to do. So you have to understand what your core competencies are, right? And, and move towards them if you strategically wanna be successful. And then um, I'd say just keep your expectations low. I'd say that. And just and move forward and take every day one a day at a time, man. I think that's really as Indian people we have these huge, huge sort of dreams uh, because we've been groomed that way to be something great. Um, but we don't realize that um, there there's so much out there that we don't know and so many challenges that are going to come in our way, whether they're personal, mental, uh, medical, God knows what it is and every day that we get to be here and experience them, the struggle, uh, man, it is, it is beautiful. And this COVID thing has even just told me so much more of that, reminded us that this moment right now is, is precious. We're all lucky. We get to work from home. We don't have to be out in the street. People in India just suffering so much. So, so you know, yeah, yeah, it is hard. It's, it's a struggle, but it's one that you asked for and you're going to get it. You're going to get it. And it's going to be very rewarding. Not in the way that you think, though, but it will be. Yeah. Oh, man. Omi, powerful stuff. Uh, and, and thank you so much for, for taking the time to speak with us and, and share insights into your life and career. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes. Subscribe to Sick Meets World on your favorite podcasting platform and share it with your friends and family. Stay tuned for our next episode, which comes out next month. And of course, be sure to check out the National Sick Campaign website for more information.